important. I, I began to investigate the Scottish salt industry in the early 1970s, in Victorian times it seems, when I was doing my PhD on the bigger, or what I thought was the bigger subject of industrialisation in the south west of Scotland. And I was intrigued by this shoreside industry um, that produced a commodity that was so essential for human life that it was sought and manufactured since Neolithic times. Salt, as, you, as you, you may or may not know, has sacred connotations. Well, in many parts of the world it was and is of immense cultural uh, significance. The supply of salt could be a cause of tensions between nations and states, as well as being a powerful um, strategic weapon during times of war. And indeed, Scotland's salt industry was a major beneficiary of such a conflict. Well, that is during the Dutch revolt against Spain, uh, Spanish rule in the 16th and 17th centuries, which heralded the golden age for, for Scotland's salt. But the Scottish industry directed, benefited direct, directly from war too very recently. Um, and purely by chance, and this is just a few months ago, I came across a document produced by the salt masters of Durham and Northumberland, in which they complained that in 1644, during the, the wars of the three kingdoms, this is the document, um, during the wars, when the Scottish army invaded England, the Scots possessed themselves of Newcastle, dispossessed divers of ye salt workers of their salt pans by reason of their loyalty to His Majesty King Charles I, and pulled down and destroyed many of them, pretending them to belong to popish and malignant owners, to the ruin of diverse families, to the end that they might thereby lessen the trade of salt in England and augment that of Scotland. And that actually happened. Um, so, so salt was an issue uh, in, in, in Anglo-Scottish relations. But at the very other end of the scale, if you like, there's the role of salt in, in everyday life. Um, and the amount of salt that was used in early modern times was, 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 was fairly high, actually. At the time of the Union of 1707, it was estimated that each household of around five people needed a minimum of two pecks of salt every year to survive. That's around 32 pints uh, dry measure, not only to season the prodigious quantities of uh, oatmeal that was a staple of the Scottish diet. Imagine porridge every day without any salt, um, but also to preserve foodstuffs over the, over the winter. And indeed, according to the Earl of Cromarty, who was a politician at the end of the 17th century, early 18th century, when King Charles II imposed a tax on salt in Scotland, uh, after the Restoration, this had led to tumults throughout many parts of the, of, of the, of the nation. So the people rioted when the price of salt rose. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be rioting as the price of gas rises, but anyway, um, uh, nevertheless. Worse, he reported, poor people in the inland districts, unable to pay the tax, but who were desperate for salt, had had no alternative to make their way to the coast uh, to supply this want by boiling salt in kettles, uh, boiling, sorry, seawater in kettles and the like to make their own salt. Now, according to Cromarty, 40,000 people, this is in the late 17th century, 40,000 people had perished as a result, dying from what he called the fluxes. Now, even if 40,000 is an exaggeration, um, the fact that he made the claim suggests that there's something in this uh, otherwise unknown about uh, uh, episode in Scottish history. Indeed, the memory of this event, this, this, this period of high prices, um, according to Cromarty, was the main reason why a proposal during the negotiations of the Union of 1707 that a tax be imposed on Scottish salt uh, enraged the whole nation. That's, that's, that's his phrase. And such was, the, such was the strength of popular feeling that no duty on Scottish salt was imposed in 1707, at least not immediately. And finally, of course, there's the political economy of, of Scottish salt. Um, we know that um, salt was a major, uh, a major issue, uh, a major issue and controversial issue during the debates that led to the Union of 1707 uh, uh, and, of course, the Union. So salt, 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 uh, salt features high uh, in, 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 in Scotland's history. But back to my own journey into salt, carrying out um, research into this industry as I did in the early 1980s was a lonely furrow to plough. Um, at the time I was interested in industrial archaeology, I still am, but, but, but less so, 
Uh, but travelling around um, Scotland's coastline looking for traces of saltworks, gurnals, pans and so forth, I was on my own. My sole companions were my very young children who would periodically plead with me uh, not to take them on yet another expedition to a salt-making location. But I wasn't for giving up, um, not least as I was becoming convinced of the significance of salt in, in, the Scot in Scottish history, as I've just kind of indicated. So when I eventually I got myself an academic position, um, the first paper I read to my newfound colleagues, they weren't overwhelmed by this, it was entitled Figuring Without Counting, Scottish Salt Production, 1713 to 1823. And the title was a reference to the fact that those few historians in Scotland who had taken any notice of the Scottish salt industry had guessed about its fortunes over time. Some said that the industry had declined after the Union of 1797. Others confidently declared that it had done well during the 18th century. Others weren't sure, most didn't care. Um, but what I'd done what I, 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 at the time was construct on the basis of data from quarterly customs and excise returns for each of Scotland's uh, salt works, these documents, um, was construct a, a graph showing salt sales over the course of the 18th century up to uh, 1823. It was thousands and thousands of vouchers I needed to do that. The job will never ever be done again. Um, uh, and and I, I, doubt, you know, I doubt if academics will be allowed to. It took me one year to compose this one graph. Anyway, by doing so, I was able to see the trajectory of Scottish salt sales over the course of the 18th century uh, and, uh, and indeed beyond. And what the numbers demonstrated was that actually the industry had grown rapidly for the first two or three decades after 1707. And I've managed now, in more recent times, because uh, I've turned back to salt for this, for this event really, um, to confirm this, from, confirm this impression of a booming industry immediately after the Union um, because of the following kind of, uh, I'm pretty sure this is what inspired the laying down of the Trinent to Cockenzie uh, Wagonway in 1722 and the subsequent relaying of the tracks a few years later because they wanted to take coal to the salt pans. Another example uh, from this uh, period is what happened on Arid in the first of Clyde in 1723. Then a Major Robertson was convinced that the island's proprietor, who was the Duke of Hamilton, could capitalise on a good coal seam he'd found at the north end of the island um, should, he, should the Duke employ uh, another three coal miners there, Robertson wrote, they would supply, I'm quoting here, would supply six pans with coals as long as he lived. Indeed, the seam of coal concerned, he said, might be wrought for many generations. Wonderful. Uh, wonderfully optimistic, but the truth is that only one pan was ever, uh, was ever um, you'll see it d um, drawn there on the, uh, on the, I haven't got my pointer, but the, 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 the circular, the, sorry, semicircular construct on the, on, oh thank you, um, on, on there um, shows where it was. There was only one pan erected at this site and it operated only intermittently and then only for 20 years. So the dream didn't last for very long. But after around 1730, my graph flattened out with exports falling off, but compensating for this were sales of salt within Scotland for domestic use, some fish preservation, and in the bleaching and printing trails, uh, trades. And so home sales in Scotland rose gradually during the 18th century, more or less in line with the growth of population, which makes sense assuming uh, salt consumption per head was roughly the same over time. Anyway, at this early seminar that I, I, I talked about and others where I presented my finding, I was given a polite hearing, but I can't say anyone was particularly excited with my revelations. In fact, when I gave uh, talks to local history societies on the salt industry around the time, audiences were, to say the least, thin. Uh, I think I had three attendees in Kincardine. So, it is really great and hugely uplifting that so many people are here today, in person, online or whatever, to learn and share knowledge and talk about and even enthuse about this remarkable industry and its history. I've waited 40 years for this moment. So, <laughs> so what's, and what's particularly satisfying for me is, is how much research effort has been devoted to the salt industry in the decades, um, that's the salt uh, pan incidentally, uh, uh, or what was 
the remains of the salt uh, works in 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 Arran. In in uh, that was in that picture was taken in the nineteen late nineteen seventies. The 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 wall has now collapsed, unfortunately. Anyway, this 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 is this is this is the book that I produced, and uh, as I say, it's great that so much work has been done subsequently by all sorts of people who are are represented here one way or another, and and I, I so look forward to hearing what people have to say. But we'll also hear today uh, and see something even more remarkable, and that's the rebirth of the industry, the appearance, if you like, of Scotland's newest, oldest industry. Uh, sea salt is now being made in several locations uh, in, in Scotland, but the ones I know best are on Sky by, by Chris and Mina Watts and, and of the Isle of Skye Sea Salt Company at St. Monan's uh, in, in, in Fife by Darren Petrie. That's the Sky operation, or it w w was. Uh, I think it's expanded a little bit so subsequently. There's um, uh, Gregory and Worley Marshall in Ayrshire at Blackthorn Salt, which is this one here, and they have a display here as well. This the today, and that operation is actually s located on the site in Ayr where salt was long manufactured before the industry's demise in the 19th century. And of course, on a smaller scale, you have the 1722 group at uh, Trenent uh, who have even built a cut down replica of an 18th century salt pan where they've been making and selling salt. And this, uh, as I understand it, has, been ins has inspired something similar here in, in Brora. So sea salt is now an environmentally friendly, sought after commodity, commercially produced at scale without using a single piece of coal, which is great. And it's worth saying this too, that what's being produced now is vastly superior to that what was that was made in former times, mainly as the seawater is so finely filtered prior to being evaporated. Okay, so let's go back to the, the history, um, if I may. Now, for the purposes of this presentation, I've reread what I wrote all those years ago, thinking at the same time about where I might have gone wrong, yes, uh, what the gaps in my understanding were, and if there were matters I might explore further. So let me begin with a very brief overview for those of you who know little about this industry. I, I think we know enough now to say that salt making in Scotland certainly had a presence by the 12th century. And at this time, the status of this manufacture was high with salt pans being the property of Scottish kings, King David I and William the Lion are the first I'm aware of, but there will be uh, many more that Richard Oram will tell us about. Scotland's monarchs in turn made grants of their pans to several of the country's monastic houses, such as Dunfermline and New Battle Abbeys and Pittenween Priory. After the Reformation, most of the salt works, these salt works became the property of the nation's landed elite while smaller single pan operations were sometimes taken over by borough uh, burgesses or those of a similar fairly high rank who saw ownership of a salt pan or salt pans as an attractive business proposition. But by and large, for much of the industry's golden age, which you can say was from the middle of the 16th century through to the, the, the early 19th century, it was the landed families who drove the industry forward. Necessarily, of course, the estates had to contain coal and skirt the coast. Some of those involved operated or were operated on a large scale. The best known, I guess, is Sir George Bruce's 40-plus pan complex at Curus. But there were other big players too, such as the, uh, the Earls of Weems, also in Fife. And there's a picture of there of, of Weems estate from the sea, but the salt pans are there on about uh, one third along the from the from the from the left. Well, on the other side of the fourth, you have the Duke of Hamilton, uh, the Dukes of Hamilton at Bowness, and so on. Now, a downside of this arrangement, that whereby the landowners uh, built and operated, uh, built the pans, was that they were heavily dependent upon the competence, managerial skills, and trustworthiness of their salt work managers or greaves. And there were characters amongst this group of men who were unable to resist the temptation to defraud their landed masters. In fact, fraud is going to be a big part of this salt story that I'm going to tell you about in the next uh, few minutes. One of the most blatant examples of this kind of defraud, uh, this fraudulent activity was David Sinclair at Dysart, who attempted to confuse his kinsman and employer Henry Sinclair by converting bushels of salt, which was the usual measure, into bowls, charging for articles for the upkeep of the pans that he hadn't actually bought, and destroying the records of the salt made and delivered. 
but most blatant of all, and you could even say stupid, uh, was delivering quantities of salt, um, was entering, sorry, quantities of salt and the duty paid into the books of the customs office, but then failing to remit any income from this, from such salt sales to Henry St. Clair. So he got caught and, in, and he didn't last long in that job. That was in 1718. And accordingly, to mitigate against this kind of thing, during the 18th century, landowners began to lease for set rentals their salt works and the associated coal pits to individuals and partnerships. Companies like the Newark, Soul, the Newark Coal Company at St. Philip's near uh, St. Monans, for example. But after the repeal of the salt duty, which had protected the Scottish industry, actually, in 1823, this is, this has protected the industry for, for more or less two centuries because Scottish salt was charged less than salt from, 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 from England and, and, and elsewhere. After 1823, the industry goes into pretty sharp decline. In fact, even before this, individual pans in some places were being leased out to very ordinary people, although a handful of bigger companies as at Preston Pans, um, as at Preston Island here off, uh, off, off Torrey, um, survived the loss of protection by making sea salt with rock salt from Cheshire. But basically, the industry goes into sharp decline in the, in the 1830s and 1840s. Now, a corollary of this decline in the status of salt making from being a royal occupation, if you like, or something that, that, that the monarchs had an interest in to what I'm talking about now, a corollary of this was the decline in the status of the salt workers or salt making as an occupation. Um, now, I'm talking here about the salters, that is the men and fewer women who worked in the pan houses and who for a long time had been highly sought after. Salt making was an indentured trade requiring an apprenticeship after which one was designated a master salter. And little wonder is to make a full pan of usable salt required fine judgment and no little skill. It was easy to damage the iron plates that comprised the pan by firing the furnaces uh, too hard or boiling the seawater too fast. Indeed, the job, um, the job still required an element of training at the turn of the 20th century because um, I discovered in July 1903 an advertisement from the Scottish Salt Company at Pinky Pans near Musselburgh, uh, an advert for a young man who wanted to learn salt making. And it's largely for this reason that for lengthy periods, the spring and summer months especially, master salters were relatively well paid. You might have read some of the accounts of these characters being in, dismal, in a dismal trade, but it wasn't quite like that. I can illustrate this last point by reference to a dispute involving the salters and their grieve at the Duke of Hamilton's colliery and salt pans at Bowness in the early 1720s. At this time, the salt workers there were earning in the region of 20 or 30 shillings a week. Now, um, this was condemned, however, as being a great deal too much for people of their rank. And it was certainly at the upper end of, the, of what represented a good wage for an ordinary day labourer of the period. Now, a, a proportion of this had to be paid to assistant salters, so, so, so it's not as good as it looks uh, on the surface. And that really explains why. Uh, so often sons and wives of salters were, 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 became the assistants of the master salter because you tend not to have to, well, I understand in the olden days you didn't have to reward your wife um, or, 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 or sons for their work in, 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 uh, when they worked for you. I think things have changed. Even so, the feeling that salters could earn too much continued to challenge salt greaves and salt work proprietors through the rest of the century. Indeed, supporting the idea that master salters were not as badly off as some descriptions uh, of their conditions suggest is fresh archaeological evidence we'll hear about today, I think, of tea drinking, wine consumption, and other signs of at least modest creature comforts in and around the salt pan houses and the salt gurnals. However, what if, 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 if I, I said I, I reread my stuff and, and thought, what did I get wrong? I didn't get this wrong, but I think what I failed to emphasize sufficiently in 1987 is that salt making was more of a seasonal occupation than I realized then. And what were called freshes or inundations of rainwater during the winter months when rivers and streams ran high reduced the salinity of the seawater, which required more coal to evaporate uh, in the pans. And so in some locations, production was halted or seriously interrupted, although not everywhere. <coughs> 
So in short, despite their relatively high earnings when their pans were going, winter was probably a time of considerable hardship for Salter families. But despite the harshness of their physical working conditions, it's not so surprising that I've seen little evidence that Salters were particularly keen to leave the trade. On the contrary, many spent their entire lives at the pans, while their sons often succeeded their fathers, wives occasionally too, so that there were in the salt-making communities um, fairly well-known families of salt workers, the Wannans, the Duncans, the Drummonds, the Tillochs, the Fords, and so on. And when a salter did leave a particular works, it was not necessarily for another occupation, but more often to go to another salt work. Uh, although given their scarcity, uh, salters could be recalled by those estate proprietors who believed that a man who at some point had worked at their pans were their property. So there's that element to it. But, but I don't see any, any, any great evidence of people w wishing to leave this trade. Indeed, there are hints that the master salters made the most of their unique skills. All the evidence I've seen suggests that collectively they were able to negotiate, to some extent anyway, the terms of their employment. There were advantages in being belonging to an occupation where although their incomes fluctuated and could be precarious, they were also able to exercise some control over the effort they put in. Um, the nature of their contracts allowed Salters a degree of flexibility of how hard they worked. The usual arrangement was that they contracted with their grieve or pan proprietor to produce a certain quantity of salt, around three bowls, in return for so many carts of coal delivered to them. And what they produced um, was, in addition to this, was what was called the overplus or oversalt, for which they were paid so much per bowl. So this constituted their legitimate earnings. And the size of the overplus too was to some extent the decision of individual salters, depending on how hard they wanted to, to work. Having said that, employers, salt work managers or greaves had ways of bringing awkward salters to heel, either collectively or individually. And the most effective means was to interrupt the supply of coal to the pans by simply ordering the coal bearers um, that is, who were often estate tenants, to stop delivering coal. Um, and similarly, a grieve could delay having a particular salter's pan repaired by going slow on this instead of being out of operation for three weeks, which often happened with pans because of the pans needed to be repaired. A pan might be shut down for a period of six or seven weeks or even longer, which of course meant for that period the salters had no income. So it was important that there was a harmonious kind of relationship between employer and master salter in the pans. During a particularly fraught time at the Duke of Hamilton's pans in Bowness, the salters were alleged, the salters there alleged that Alexander Arch sorry, Archibald Grossart, who was the grieve, had punished some of their number for complaining to the Duke and in public, which was not the thing to do, about their conditions and the treatment of them. Grossart's response to this outrageous act had been to stop a couple of the Salter's pans by 14 and 17 weeks, respectively. Sanders Duncan, another Salter there, was put out of action for roughly the same time because Grossart had refused to have his lum or chimney uh, rebuilt. The reason reported was that Duncan had dared to attempt to stop Grossart's sons from taking mussels from his bucket pot, which was a pretty smart way um, perhaps essential way on the part of Duncan of supplementing his, his family's diet. But as I said a couple of minutes ago, the salt workers' situation did deteriorate in the early 19th century. Indicative of their reduced status is what seems to have been a rise in the number of cases of minor criminality involving salters, theft and housebreaking and assault were the crimes I've seen accused, been accused of. Perhaps in part accounting for this descent into petty criminality was what happened at Bowness in 1811, which is a pretty tragic tale. After several centuries of operation, the Duke of Hamilton or the Ducal Hamilton families, colliery and salt pans at Bowness were to be given up. Now, not, least, not the least of the reasons for this was competition from the relatively new works uh, at Ayr, um, where production costs were lower, um, prices were higher and the quality of the salt was better than, than that produced on the 4th, which meant that air was going, it was taking away the Glasgow trade. Glasgow was the big market for, for Scottish salt, um, salt producers in, in the 18th and early 19th centuries. 
So Bowness uh, suffers from this competition. Now, at the time of the threatened, clo at the close of the closure, a petition from the coal miners uh, who were to be made redundant was um, successful in that the owner, the Marquis of Douglas, made a handsome donation for their upkeep, which was supplemented by a subscription opened for them in the borough of Bowness itself. In stark contrast, a similar and subsequent petition from the nine salters at the same works, in which they claimed that they and their families were in the utmost want, produced no such favourable response. And this was in spite of the fact that the Salter's petition, in the Salter's petition were listed not only the dependent wives and 35 children, that is an average of four per household, but also the lengthy period some of them had been in the Hamilton family's employment. Evidently, however, what happened to them, that is the Salter's, was of no consequence. Like the industry itself, in a few years, they no longer mattered. Now let me move on quickly to what was a gap in my understanding um, in, way back in the 1980s, something I couldn't quite explain to audiences then, my small audiences I may say, was how seawater was conveyed to the pans from what were usually called bucket pots, which you, you can see here. Now we've long known about these, effectively shoreside reservoirs where seawater was gathered and from which at least some unwatered material settled to the bottom before being used in the pans. But what next? Um, maybe, some of you, maybe, maybe some of you enthusiasts and archaeologists and, and the rest know this already, but I didn't. Here's a seaward gable of the early, of an early, of the early 18th century salt work on Arran, which I first visited in the 1970s. Now, it's a long way from the sea to what looked like some sort of water intake midway up the panhouse wall. Now, there's a vague mention in some histories that describe salt manufacturing of both men and women laboriously using hand buckets and transferring water to the pans. But just how anyone would manage to carry water into this panhouse, which is typical of the period, I had no idea. And by the end of the 18th century, if not much earlier, I think this practice, if it ever existed, must have disappeared. Now, why do I say this? Well, partly through joining with Joe and Tom Dawson some three years ago, um, as they took pictures from a drone uh, on the shore at Preston Pans, or Kirkensie Preston Pans area, it began to become clearer to me and to them how the transfer of seawaters to the pans occurred. Um, and here's Here's a still from that um, film that, that they made available to me kindly. Post holes in the rock near what seemed to be natural or near natural reservoirs indicated that there had once been structures held up by wooden posts. I then supplemented this um, fascinating drone-derived material by looking at contemporaneous artwork. Now, there's this well-known view of Weems Castle, um, uh, gardens and the salt works by the Dutch um, artist Van Sypen from around 1720, in which you can see um, both the poles and the structures they supported in, in the middle of the picture, really. It's not all that clear, but, but I think you'll get a, an idea of what I'm talking about. But even clearer, and this is what excited me, I think, a little. I came across this drawing of Weems Castle by John Clark of Eldon in the early 18th century. Now, if you look carefully, um, uh, yeah, see here, here you have a salt works basically, and there you see a wooden structure, a, a structure on wooden poles, and you you won't see very clearly. I'm sorry about this, but there is a a wand here with a with a with a rope I think attached to it, which is clearly used to bring water by you know buckets into that reservoir on the top of the wooden structure, um, and even so 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 we get an idea of what was happening, and and and, and that that process may have been operated, that, that, that is the wand may have been operated by, a, by the salter's wife or son or whoever was working for the master salter. And finally, on this one, there's this picture here of Joppa Pans uh, near Edinburgh by an unnamed artist in which is visible a similar sort of structure. There's, there's the pans here, there's the chimneys, and here you'll see, well you won't see, but <laughs> there's a structure, a similar structure, which looks like an Archimedes screw which takes water, I think, up to this um, reservoir, which then allows water to be run into the pans um, um, as, as, as required. So, so gravity do, 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 does the work. So I, I just thought 
I was fascinated to discover how that happened, and I didn't know that in 1987. So um, another thing I did wrong or, or missed in 1987 was that I, I missed some salt pan operations, I missed some salt works. Um, there's this one, for example, in, in, in Butte, about which I can find very little, but it's clearly an early 18 or late 17th or early 18th salt work. There are others that I missed on Lam, at Lamb Lash in Arran, uh, Thurso in Caithness, and we're going to hear more about one in Port Soy, um, which, which uh, later on today. But I want to end this presentation. I think I've got seven or eight minutes, um, but don't please sound that klaxon. Um, but uh, I'd like to end this presentation by introducing another group of uh, individuals associated with the salt trade, but about which virtually has nothing has been written. I certainly didn't write anything about it. I've not seen anything else written about it. And these are the salt officers the men who were appointed by the British state from 1713 to collect the tax on salt that had been agreed at the time of the Union of 1707. Now in 17, 17, 1755, middle 18th century, there was across Scotland a total of 97 men employed to manage and collect the salt duties. They were spread around the country, with most, as you'd expect, stationed on the fourth, where the bulk of Scotland's salt works were located. Preston Pans had the highest number of these officers, 26 salt officers in Preston Pans. Alloa had 22, followed by Kirkcaldy, 20, Bowness with 14, and there were smaller numbers in other places like Ayr and, and Irvine and Campbelltown and Stranraer. And when you add to these the other customs and excise officers stationed in the various customs precincts and outports, outports you get the impression that these coastal towns and villages were chock-a-block with revenue officers. So at Preston Pans, for instance, in addition to the 26 salt officers, there were 13 men employed by the customs office, making a total of 39 state officials. And these were tiny wee places. At Bowness, remarkably, there were even more, a total complement of as many 41 local tax collectors. So if we're trying to recreate and understand life at Scotland's salt manufacturing centres, it's important to recognise that salt works were at the heart of what were bustling industrial communities. And this is partly captured, um, partly, ca now, oh no, here we are, partly captured by this picture, again, a, cl a sort of close-up of, of Weems, where you see the salt works, but all sorts of people scurrying about being busy. Um, so I pay tribute to my archaeologist colleagues who are doing such tremendous work in excavating long-buried and cold, silent panhouses, the foundations of early empty gurnals and other buildings associated with the salt work. We're learning so much from their findings. But these were peopled places. So to complete the picture, we need different kinds of evidence and to know more about the many individuals and families who made their livings in this environment. Now, I've said a bit about that. So what was going on at a typical salt work? For a start, the pans were fired for 24 hours at a time. That was the time required in order to make a full pan of salt. The aim was to make five full pans a week. But this meant that some salters had to be at work during the night, keeping the furnaces going, adding more seawater and drawing off impurities. Making salt, though, was only part of the picture. If we'd been there at the time, we'd have seen lines of coal bearers delivering pan wood or small coal from nearby pits to the pans. And at the other end of the salt production process, there was the laborious process of carrying recently manufactured salt from the pans to the nearby gurnals or salts or salt stores. Much of this was done by females, described as salt bearers, who also carried salt for sale into the surrounding countryside and more distant towns. In the shadows might be one or two women probably older women who from time to time were asked to make salt pokes or sacks in return for rent-free accommodation. And often there was a jostle, a jostle, sorry, of people inside and outside the gurnals as merchants and local consumers arrived to purchase salt in all sorts of quantities. And this, of course, had to be weighed carefully on scales by salt officers and documented on a complicated series of forms to ensure the correct amount of salt duty was paid. If, as in most cases, salt was to be shipped off, shipped off on the merchant's behalf and taken coastwise to towns north of Fife or by sea or overland to the west coast, bearers were required to take salt to the harbour or put it onto horses for overland journeys. In addition 
And adding to the hubbub, there were the numerous tradesmen, the masons, the joiners, the coopers, the smiths, and others employed at various times to maintain the pans, buildings, and equipment. And in turn, these men required supplies of nails and iron and stone and tar and so on, which were brought by horses and on carts into the works. And some of the bigger operations had their own lime kilns, while others were linked with other salt users nearby, like potteries and chemical works and glass works. So these are busy places, our salt work communities. And as I've mentioned, amongst this hive of activity, where were salt officers. At virtually every salt work in the country, they would be located in a basic, specially built, dimly lit lodge or office. As determined by the Board of Customs, these were a standard size. They were, almost, uh, they were almost square. They were 10 feet by 8 feet internally and placed so that they were in sight of the pans and the gunnels. That is where the salt was stored under lock and key after it had been deposited um, on, on, on prior to its sale. In charge was a controller, and beneath him were one or more supervisors or officers and watchmen. And they all each had their specific sets of duties. Um, I'll just show you here, which is a picture of a salt worker. This is Lymington, not, not Scotland, but, but it shows you that the, the salter is carefully observed. And that is because it, the, the, the watchmen were required, in theory anyway, to be there at all times of the day and night to make sure that no salt is being drawn off during the manufacturing process by the salters um, and, and then who would then maybe sell it to their, their friends and, and neighbours. But um, it's quite interesting that, that that didn't actually happen. So um, watchmen were then required not to be there in attendance all the time, but to, period, to, to, to make spot checks, if you like, at any time of the day or night. And then the watchmen, in their turn, in case they weren't doing the job, had to be watched um, by officers. <laughs> and then in their turn, the controllers were advised that they too had to drop in to make sure that the officers were doing their job and the watchmen were doing their job. And it was a heavily um, bureaucratized um, business. Um, so there's all sorts of ways in which, and I, won't, I, won't, I don't have time really to, 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 to go into this, but all sorts of ways in which, uh, if you like, fiddles were... were, were, were um, were, uh, were, 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 were um, going on in this industry. Um, so my, my numbers on the graph that I referred to, I, I'm pretty sure that the, the trends are, are right, but the numbers, are, the, the amounts of salt that were sold um, are probably underestimated. I think there was a great illegal trade in the sale of salt because of the ways in which the salters were able to draw off salt and, and, and sell uh, illicitly to their there's their friends and, and, and neighbours. So I won't say much more. I think, I think I'll wind this up, but, but I will say this, that there were spectacular instances of fraudulent activity. One of the most spectacular was at Preston Pans in 19, 1797, because there the supervisor another, and another four officers were dismissed from His Majesty's service for several failings, but above all for suspected connivance with the salters and others to evade paying the salt tax. And it was because of this kind of thing that the board in Edinburgh in 1795 forbade officers from, and I'm quoting, taking dinners or any gratuity, whatever, from dealers in salt, which was a belated, if necessary, instruction. But as I say, or has been pointed out, time's running out. So I'll end by saying this, that I hope what I've just said has got this splendid symposium off to the start you wish for. It's been a pleasure for me to revisit the salt industry on Joe's behalf, because in doing so, I've had, uh, I've had the opportunity of returning to the archives from which I've discovered new things and which for a historian is always a delight. I know I'm going to learn a whole lot more today uh, and indeed tomorrow too, um, which I might even inspire me sufficiently to write a new book. But thank you very much for listening.